Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Just how devastating is climate change? What can be done to reverse the ill effects of climate change, such as melting glaciers, desertification, and rising seas? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our show. It seems every day there's more and more scientific evidence that climate change is occurring and that much of that change is very detrimental to humans and other living species. We're gonna focus a little today on climate change. My guest is an expert in this area. My guest today is Mr. Felix Dodds. Felix Dodds is an accomplished leader of civil society and non-governmental organization participation in the United Nations processes, particularly in environment and sustainable development areas. A 20-year veteran of conferences going back to the Earth Summit in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro, he has led non-governmental organization policy coalitions, chaired the annual UN Department of Public Information Conference, and edited or co-authored 10 books on the United Nations and various issues. Mr. Dodds is a fellow at the Global Research Institute at the University of North Carolina. Felix Dodds, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you being with me today. You've got quite a list of accomplishments here. We're going to get into a lot of them in just a moment. We talk about climate change. We hear this term sustainable development, which really came out of the 1992 Earth Summit, the UN Conference on Environment and Development. Before we go too far into it, how do you define sustainable development? It seems like if we had three people in the room, we might have five definitions. Uh, you were at least five definitions. <laughs> at least. Yeah, I mean, the sustainable development concept came out a little earlier than that and was, I guess, promoted by the Brundtland Commission as the major um, way of addressing how we can live um, on this planet within the natural resource boundaries that we have and hand something to future generations so they might live in a similar way to us. And so what's happened most recently to define that is the Stockholm Resilience Institute and um, other scientific places have come together with what's known as the planetary boundaries and they've defined nine planetary boundaries climate change being the most important that we at the moment are exceeding and so I think um, to talk about sustainable development and climate change together is really important. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that the United Nations has been a pivotal player in these discussions. We can go back to one of the <coughs> first conferences back in 1972. The UN brought the countries of the world together. There have been many since then. You mentioned 1992, the UN Conference on Environment and Development that was in Brazil. And the s concept of sustainable development, Agenda 21, came out of that which was very logical, practical suggestions on how to conserve energy, not to overtake or undermine any country's sovereignty or anything like that. You hear a lot about that today. But the UN seems to be a pivotal player through the ability to bring the players together. And also, you see Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who has made that one of his top five priorities. In fact, maybe even one or two. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, you have to say there's a difference between Europe, and I'm a you know, European, I come from the UK and the US. For us, um, you know, climate change is a reality. We accept the scientific evidence. Something like 97% of scientists have uh, said that climate change is happening, and um, I think that's pretty solid evidence. Um, in this country, there's a different kind of conversation going on, and there's an attack, as you know, on um, Agenda 21 uh, by uh, some people, and I think they misunderstand what Agenda 21 is. Agenda 21 was, as you were saying, some practical examples of what you could do. It's not mm -hmm. asking everybody to do it, but here are some suggestions. Our best thoughts in 1992 on how to tackle the environment and development challenges of the day. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you mentioned 1992 and the, the conference that was there, and then, of course, 
20 years later, we had uh, in 2012, I guess it was, the Real Plus 20 to a new development agenda. And this was the Real Plus 20 conference that was held in Rio de Janeiro yeah. and the copy of the book that our viewers can take a look at. But uh, what uh, was the what was the concept 20 years later? You were talking about the sustainable development concept. What did we what did we focus on in Rio in 2012 from June 20th through the 22nd to try to get help us get a better handle on climate change, sustainable development, and those types of activities? I think you know it, it's a fascinating story if you go back maybe five years before because um, we'd been starting to implement the 10-year outcome from uh, the Johannesburg um, summit in 2002 and we found by 2007 that actually a lot of it hadn't been implemented um, and President Mbeki of South Africa said basically sustainable development was dead and President Lula of Brazil in 2008 <coughs> picked up the baton and said well we have to relook at what are the challenges today what are the things that are uh, have emerged since 1992 that need to be looked at. What are the things that we didn't do well and that we need to um, address? And what's the fundamental drivers that are causing unsustainable patterns of consumption? And so Rio Plus 20 started to look at the economy. I mean, you know, it's James Carvel's comment, it's the economy, stupid. Well, it took us a little while to get there. Mm -hmm. And one of the outcomes from Rio Plus 20 was that a number of countries, 50, would start to run natural uh, capital accounts as well as their normal accounting to look at what they could do to conserve their resources but also to best price them and so that was a really important um, part of the agenda the other part of it of course from a uh, perspective of setting targets and goals was that we'd learned from the Millennium Summit in 2000 that by setting goals and underneath those a set of targets uh, governments, civil society, business could focus on trying to deliver whether uh, they wanted to deliver eradicating uh, malaria or they wanted to deal with AIDS or whether they wanted to address um, the amount of people who had access to water. So Rio Plus 20 gave us a new uh, starting point for the discussion on what should be the goals that would take the place of the Millennium Development Goals in 2015. And uh, we know that some of those are likely to be water, energy, food, three of the really critical issues that are now on the agenda, which were not so much true in 1992. In the next 20 years, we'll see a shortfall in food production of 30 to 50 percent. We'll have a shortfall in energy. Um, and this is due to a rising um, population, another billion people but also due to an increased urbanization, something like 70% of people will live in urban areas in the next 20 years. Um, and of course, the success rate of countries like China and India, whose economic growth patterns are mimicking the ones that we have had over uh, the recent years. And of course, they are therefore consuming different forms of um, of resources and at a, at, a, at a high rate and so you need to deal with that and the big worry of course is that um, there's expectation of 30 percent um, <coughs> disparity between availability of water um, that we need to, to live and what actually is going to be there and you add your first comment about climate change in and all of this gets even more complicated. Mm -hmm. It certainly does. And we see that the, the patterns are changing quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. The glaciers are melting in virtually every country. There may be a few where they're expanding. But I think in the state of Alaska alone, there were like 100,000 glaciers and something like 13 were expanding and the rest were shrinking. You see in, in the areas, the Andes, where the indigenous peoples will run out of water in not too many years. California is undergoing a drought, Huge. a severe drought. Yeah. Australia has had these yeah. problems. Uh, every, it seems every country on planet Earth has been touched by the adverse consequences of climate change. You were talking about the population, and yeah. of course there are about 7.2 billion people now. As, as our aspirations rise, as people work their way out of poverty, as they rise to a higher socioeconomic mm -hmm. level, it's natural they would want to have refrigerators, mm -hmm. stoves, uh, cars, those types of things. But should we be focusing a bit on the expanding population because it's been estimated to go up to nine to 12 billion, I think by 2050. And of course that would put even more pressure 
on the finite resources which are disappearing. The fishes are disappearing. But how can we deal with that without being draconian or uh, trying to impose some type of regulation, but to encourage people to look at uh, perhaps uh, how, how this population development is affecting the Earth? That's a very good question. And I think that you know, the problem isn't so much the, um, the amount of new people, because a lot of those will be in least developed countries or, or, or lower developed countries, and so their consumption rates will be um, a lot less. The problem is the consumption rates in the north and the model that we had being ch copied by China and India, the other two big um, population areas. And so we need to find a way of changing those consumption patterns uh, to make them, in a sense, use our resources much more sensibly, smartly, as some people call it, we need to design our urban areas to use less energy, to conserve more water, um, to have less travel for the food. We need to get much better quality food than we've had in the past. And so those are some interesting, you know, really local challenges. And I think they're really exciting because, you know, what we all want is our children to live in a, you know, a nice environment, a healthy environment, one which, you know, um, they can have their children in. And I think that's something, wherever you are in the political spectrum, is something you want. And the question is, how do we do that? We can do that together, and then we have a chance of doing it without draconian uh, impacts. But down the road, if we don't do the things now, then it's going to be even more problematic. And the chances of armed conflict over water, over food, etc., is going to increase. And you have trade-offs. So, you know, at the moment, America is exporting a lot of its water through the production of crops. Mm -hmm. uh, your aquifer in, uh, in the south is drying up, and it's not being replenished. So some very important national as well as kind of state-level decisions that this country needs to make to ensure that it has water and food for future generations. Mm -hmm. And of course our viewers can go to your website at www.felixdodds.net backslash books and get much more information on your recent book plus the other nine or ten that you wrote yeah. and uh, much more about the topics we're talking about today. You've brought up so many interesting points. One that came to mind when you're talking about the North. We talk about the developed North and these are the developed countries. Yeah as opposed to the economically developing southern countries, as we normally say. How do they view this in your deliberations and your discussions with leaders from, say, the United States, from Europe, uh, wherever, from Asia, from the developed countries, as opposed to the developing countries, who many of whom are being ravaged by climate change, especially if you're a small island developing mm. state or something like that. You see the waters coming up. But how do, how do their perceptions differ on how to deal with this problem? Or are they getting closer to trying to identify a common goal and a common method to deal with the problem? I think one of the most fascinating um, changes between 1992 and 2012, when we had the Rio Plus 20 conference, was the leadership. If you go back to 1992, the leadership tended to be from America or tended to be from Europe, and the issues on the agenda tended to come from that. For the 2012, you saw a transition of leadership to the new emerging economies in the South. You had countries like Brazil, who were just very impressive. South Africa, India, China, Colombia. Um, these countries, Egypt, were all playing very critical roles in recognizing there can only be one form of development, and that development has to be sustainable development. Now, that wasn't true in 92. And so I think there's a lot of hope. The problem we ha suffered for the developed countries, places like America and Europe, was the impact of the financial crisis. And that impact reduced their vision, reduced their belief that we could move to a more sustainable uh, way of living on that planet. And so that vision came from the developing countries this time. I think that's very healthy. Uh, and I think still we have a bit of a kind of depressed um, feeling around um, you know, America, around Europe, about what's possible. We need to get over that. And you know, one of the strengths of this country has been its vision and its hope and its aspirations. And it needs to get back to that kind of, uh, that kind of leadership. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is an independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. Today, we're taking a look at climate change and many of the ill effects of climate change, such as melting glaciers, rising seas, and desertification. My guest is an expert on this topic. My guest today is Mr. Felix Dobbs. Mr. Dobbs is a 20-year veteran of conferences going back to the Earth Summit and in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro. Felix, we're talking about this whole concept of climate change, and it's been just a, a heated debate, <laughs> and maybe that's the appropriate word uh, for this discussion. We're talking about developed versus developing countries. Yeah. Are the, the developing countries, economically developing, are, have realized for many years that it's costing them. It's costing them the way that the weather patterns are changing, the seas are rising. Mm -hmm. But the developed countries, are they coming to the realization that it is going to cost them it's costing them now. Many cities, you look at New York, Miami, mm -hmm. they're, they're very concerned about the rising sea levels, really wiping out large parts of real estate in yeah, these yeah. cities. But are they starting to realize that if we don't deal with these problems now, they're going to cost us much more in the future? You alluded to that earlier, but is that is that sinking in that we're starting to really treat it seriously? Well. I, th I think, again, you, you have to differentiate between the U.S. and and many of the other developed countries in the way that they're approaching mm -hmm. it. Th there is no question in Europe. We know uh, the science. We're acting on it. We're reducing our emissions. We may have uh, occasional um, setbacks in certain areas, but predominantly, you know, we're, we're trying to address those things. The U.S. is doing it, but not through national government policies. More of them is happening at the local state level through businesses. But I think in the sense of your planning, which is kind of what you're talking about, I think there's a real problem because if you were to look at the sea level rise predictions for the United States, you would take away your insurance from most of this, the, um, the housing and the buildings that are on the shores, or you would be investing in a lot more uh, resilience to those cities. And I don't see that money being made available um, through either state legislators or through national uh, budgetary things. You know, I live in North Carolina. The outer banks are very susceptible to this um, challenge of climate change. So if this country wants to invest in the future, and wants to protect its shoreline, there needs to be a national debate about how we do that, because it's only through working together you'll be able to address those challenges. Mm -hmm. One of the fascinating things, I did a, recently a uh, report which uh, the US Navy was involved on climate change and oceans, and um, US Navy, they've seen the science and they're just acting on it. They're build, all their buildings are being uh, built in a way that accepts climate change is, is happening. You know, as, you, as you, I'm sure you've mentioned on the show, the US Navy is now a green fleet. It's moved from, mm -hmm. um, uh, from oil to, uh, to uh, biofuels. They're acting on the basis that it's happening and therefore we need to do something about it uh, responsibly. We need the rest of this country to do the same thing. And everybody has a role to play. You mentioned about national governments. Mm -hmm. we'll just, since we're here in the United States, we'll just mention the U.S. government from time to time has moved on environmentally sound policies, but other times not so much perhaps. But it seems the mayors of cities, mm -hmm. uh, for example, in the United States, the U.S. has never really ratified the uh, Kyoto C Protocol, I That's guess right. it was 1997 or something like that. Mm -hmm. But there were over 1,200 mayors in major cities that did. They said, uh, they didn't ratify it, they said we're going to agree to try to work towards these goals. But there are mayors all over the world, in Barcelona and uh, Bolivia, wherever it might be, who are really focusing on what cities can do. What role can cities play? Because they're going to have the bulk of the population in the future. Th they are, and I mean, they have already got mm, that. I exactly. mean, we've, we've gone over 50% of the population being in urban areas. But I think that um, cities are close to where people are, and they know what's happening. It's no longer an intellectual debate, it's a reality. Mm -hmm. You know, the governor of, uh, of New Jersey had to deal with the consequences of the storms, and he knows what uh, the results of that were. So I think more and more, as they are at the forefront of that, they can start to, I think, show the leadership that at the moment has not happened um, in, uh, in Congress on the issue of uh, climate change. I think the other thing with it is it's not just cities, it's actually the states, you know, the, the, your, your, your regional government level. 
I think can play a really critical role in, in driving um, uh, particular changes because they deal with infrastructure uh, uh, issues. And I think, uh, again, you've seen some leadership from, uh, from the New York uh, governor, but also Arnie when he was uh, the governor in, uh, uh, in uh, California. California. And, of mm -hmm. course, you've just had the UN um, Secretary General appoint the former mayor of, um, of New York, Bloomberg, as his cities and climate change uh, envoy. And that goes to exactly your point that that's really where a lot of work could be done, which could be really, I think, uh, eye-opening to um, lots of uh, communities wherever they are in the world, if you can set um, in motion a process of sharing those good examples. And maybe Bloomberg mm -hmm. is the person to help us do that. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of best practices out there yeah. that, that they are sharing, and yeah. they can learn from yeah. one another. We talked about the role of the United Nations as far as being critical to bring the but really the all 193 governments yeah. the member states together under one roof to talk about this problem but also the non-governmental organizations other people who have an interest in this and we should all have an interest because we all live on planet earth we've seen s uh, several of the united nations conferences and of course there will be a major conference in lima in 2014 mm. 2015 is the big year in paris and a lot of people are saying a lot of scientists are saying we're running out of time we're just about if we haven't hit that tipping point where we can't slow this climate change process down or reverse it that we're going to go over the <laughs> beyond that point what would you like to see come out of paris as far as a grand bargain to have the countries and it's supposed to be a mandatory agreement that comes out of this, as I understand it, they up to this point has been voluntary and they, they set these goals and then try to work towards them. But this one is supposed to lock the countries in to agree to reduce CO2 by a certain level or different things. What should come out of that or what would you like to see come out of it? What I'd like to see and what's going to happen are two different things. You know, I'd like to us to agree to deliver on the two degree rise that Copenhagen had set uh, in the Copenhagen Accord. I don't think at the moment, I think we're on a trajectory for four to six at the moment. And so the question with it is, um, we'll have to adapt um, to climate change and how much impact will we see in the developed countries that forces that adaption to happen quicker and to, uh, we hope, you know, move to more climate friendly um, fuels. But I think that the challenge for for Paris, the, the, the deliverable for Paris is the money to enable developing countries to move away from uh, the industrialization that we had. And so I think that the grand bargain, if there is a grand bargain in Paris, is that there's enough money uh, that helps move China, moves India, moves um, many of the big uh, developing countries into a kind of non-carbon economy quick so that we don't actually find that um, we may have solved the problems in the developed countries, but the developing country now, I mean, China's the biggest producer of CO2, so we need to address those challenges, I think. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And s we've heard so many debates on this, especially with the use of fossil fuels, with coal, yeah. with oil, even gas to a large degree. And of course, now we have this fracking that's taking place. These are ostensibly the cheapest forms of energy, but really, it, they are receiving like $500 billion a year in subsidies to mm -hmm. be able to provide this type of energy to people around the world. If these subsidies were uh, put, uh, maybe not that large, but into alternative fuels, clean fuels, uh, green fuels, so yeah. to speak, would they not become much more energy efficient? Would they not become more cost efficient? And we could move into these and start moving away from these fossil fuels? So, so I think we are doing that. And the costs, as you know, of um, wind and solar, particularly off offshore wind, are now coming and making them competitive in the context of the energy market. Those need to be, in a sense, um, accelerated out quicker than at the moment that they're doing. And that needs governments to kind of give the right incentives to enable that to happen. Yeah, you know, there's no reason why any house now shouldn't be built with a, a solar panel um, on it that can help reduce the amount of energy that you're using. So <clears throat> I think there are, there are really easy wins if we can get the political will behind it. I was reminded of Einstein's quote, which, you know, there are two 
things in the universe that are infinite, um, the universe and, and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about <laughs> the universe. Uh, my worry is that the human stupidity issue may become the driving, uh, the driving force behind why we don't do stuff. And our big problem is that there doesn't seem to be the leadership that we uh, would need at the moment in the governments, the prime ministers and the presidents that we need to understand that we're all part of a global community. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And of course, these issues are so important, and you mentioned the Millennium Development Goals, Sustainable Development, and they will be coming up <coughs> with a Sustainable Development Goal in 2015 yeah. to after that 15-year period where the Sustainable, uh, the eight uh, Millennium Development Goals have been focused upon. But these are all so important, and we really have to focus our attention on this and to really move forward on it. But uh, Felix Dodds, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and thank a very, very informative much. program. Thank, thank you. you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us on today's Global Connections program.